Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, this event is co-sponsored by the festival and by the Department of Comparative Literature at King's. My name is Rosa Mucinat, and I'm senior lecturer in the uh, Department of Comparative Literature. Okay. So it's a great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Franco Moretti. Franco is the Danny C. and Laura Louis Bell Professor in the Humanities at the University of Stanford, California. And tonight he's going to talk to us about the emotions of London. Um, before we, we, we hear from Franco, I just, had a couple, I just wanted to say a couple of words by way of introduction, and, 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 and I'll try and be, I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, how to introduce Franco Moretti? Perhaps by saying that um, he's simply one of the most influential and controversial, perhaps, scholars working in the humanities today. And he uh, fills lecture theaters at 7 p.m. or 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, so not everybody can do that. Um, uh, he, he has thought in original and profound ways about many aspects of literature. And I'd like to um, just emphasize two particular areas of his work that perhaps will have a bearing on what we will hear from him tonight. On the one hand, his interest in space and place. And on the other hand, the way he has been able to take on literary studies from an entirely new radical angle and put forward what we might call a revolution in, in, in method. Since his early books, Science Taken for Wonder and The Way of the World, space and especially urban space and the modern city, London, Paris, have been at the center of Moretti's critical reflections. And this has reached uh, what to me is a high point uh, with the seminal Atlas of the European Novel that appeared in 1998, where he not only evoked the novel's sense of place in rich and fascinating ways, but he also argued for the use of maps as tools for literary analysis. And tonight's talk will reveal perhaps new directions in which he, this area of his research has developed. But the aspect of Moretti's current work that has attracted the most attention and criticism is certainly he, his use of quantitative methods. Uh, in particular, computational modeling, as seen in uh, the essays collected under the title Distant Reading, a book that appeared in, in 2013. So distant reading goes against the grain of what many perceive as the uh, essence of criticism and perhaps of the humanities as a whole, that is the practice of close reading. But in a more positive sense, we can also take it as a challenge to literary studies to widen our horizon, embrace the possibilities offered by uh, digital technologies and by big data repositories, rather than feeling threatened by them. <coughs> and most importantly, putting them to work to answer our questions and to um, uh, create new knowledge in our field. Okay, so and, and, uh, I expect the quantitative element of, of, of Franco's work will also come through in the presentation. So I want to stop here. There will be some time after the talk for members of the audience to ask questions. Um, and uh, now, would you please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Franco Moretti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rosa, for inviting me and for these nice words. And all of you for being here and staying here. And uh, uh, today's uh, talk is one of the many projects uh, we are conducting at this small research group at Stanford. We call it the Literary Lab because we try to work in ways comparable to those of scientific uh, labs. Uh, it will indeed try to join uh, uh, quantitative elements and uh, geographic elements. As you can see, uh, even though mostly the text is my work, uh, it is a joint project, like almost all of ours. Ryan Heuser uh, was a PhD student in our department. Then he dropped out. We promptly uh, um, uh, gave him some part-time job as a programmer. Then he decided to become a graduate student again, and that brought our programming skills to uh, halt, um, because this literary lab is uh, 
far less fancy and well-funded than actual labs. This is a project he and I have been doing together. The initial um, point, the idea, in a sense, was uh, uh, indeed something that I had uh, uh, come across while working on uh, the Atlas of the European Novel, where I had done maps like this. So this would be you know, characters in uh, one of Dickens' great uh, um, London novels. So this is it's simple. You basically find the place where the characters live or work, and then uh, you, know, you add other elements. This is a base map. You add other elements, and you try to think about what the spatial distribution may tell you about the structure. But there was something else that I'd always thought was potentially interesting in geography. That is to say, it's one thing to map material entities like human beings, fictional human beings, but still, you know, human beings. Uh, what about uh, non-material elements like ideas? Uh, the Atlas of the European Novel had 100 maps. Only one map mapped something, uh, so to speak, immaterial. And it was a map of the location of ideas in uh, Russian novels of the 19th century, Dostoevsky, Turgenev, uh, Chernyshevsky, and so on. I had a geographer who was uh, supervising my work, uh, a real geographer, uh, <coughs> while I was working at the Atlas. This was the only map, we disagreed on a lot of things. This was the only thing that he said, you should not publish this, because abstract entities like this can't really be mapped. I mean, this is very imprecise, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I, uh, I published it, but you know, the thought uh, stayed in my mind. And then, at a certain point, uh, in the contemporary perversion of uh, intellectual work, in which the United States and the United Kingdom are uh, uh, the avant-garde in the world, uh, there was a grant. We needed a grant because we needed a grant in order to pay. Uh, Ryan for his programming, uh, but the grant was only for crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing means you create a project and then ask an unknown crowd of individuals you do not know to, um, to uh, add elements uh, to this project. You will see, uh, it's pointless for me to explain in the abstract, in a few minutes, I'll explain. The point is, you will never know the crowd of people working for you. So you have to design as precise a project as possible. I didn't want to do this. I thought you know, crowdsourcing is a mess, precisely because you don't know who you are working with. You don't even know whether they know English. And, uh, um, but we needed the money, and we would certainly get money. From, so we did this. And we designed. I said, well, OK. Let's think about something having to do with London and with, indeed, non-material, uh, emotions. Emotions uh, distributed in novels through the urban landscape. There was a passage I encountered in uh, Phil Fisher's book on the vehement passions. Each citizen has a specific cluster of dangers of which she is constantly or intermittently in fear. Each person will localize the general anticipatory fear in a personal geography of fear. And it wasn't just the geography of fear that struck me, but the other passage in Reddit is the passion of fear above all that isolates the element of suddenness. It's true, I think, but of course, what happens suddenly can be localized in time, but can also be localized in space. And so I thought, well, if indeed fear and fear in novels has this element of suddenness, this means that it will be possible to find uh, um, its locations. And if that is the case, then we design for the crowd a very simple uh, um, project, which consisted in uh, identifying whether a given passage contained, was organized around an emotion of fear, of happiness, well-being, or neither. Uh, initially, it was more complicated. Then we simplified into this, because otherwise it was pure chaos. We had a corpus that went from 1700 to 1900. 
Uh, of course, in the earlier period, uh, there are fewer novels, but all in all, it's almost 5,000 novels, as you can see, so on a very large number of novels. The starting point is you have a program looking for named entities, so proper names, and uh, then uh, you clean from the proper names uh, all the names of people or of, you know, uh, nation states, et cetera, et cetera, and you end up, I think we ended up with a very clean uh, corpus of London toponyms. Uh, this is the geography toponyms uh, uh, from 1700 to uh, 1900 in the whole corpus. This is all geographical toponyms, and as you can see, it's a fairly stable. So the presence of geography remains more or less what it was in 1700 all the way to 1900. Instead, London toponyms is a different story. As you can see, the slope is upward, and it seems very slight, but actually, for reasons that I don't understand, this is a logarithmic scale, so the slope would be much more pronounced than you can see it here. And what seems to me to be happening, I haven't really studied this image that much, is that there are a lot of places where there are no London toponyms at all, but there are more and more London novels, and that's what makes London more of a presence in, uh, uh, in the corpus of uh, English novels. And uh, this is now the unit with which we would work. We would find a toponym, the program would find a toponym, in this case it's Regent Street, and then we would get 50 words before the toponym and after the toponym and give the crowd these 100 words uh, as a part, you know, why 50 and 50 and not 100 and 100 or 10 and 10? Because uh, you have to choose. Uh, we played with a few measures and then we used uh, this. It may have made matters uh, worse or it may have just worked fine. They would have to read this and tag it as um, uh, including inclining towards happiness, fear, or whatever. Fine. So this is the design of the experiment. As you can see, and this is a problem which digital humanities uh, has, this is a weakness, not a problem. Um, this is really not a hypothesis that we are testing. It is an exploration of something that we don't know. There is nothing wrong with explorations, especially now that we have enormous digital archives that no one has read. It's a good thing to explore, but intellectually it's less satisfying than having a theory and devising a way to test it. Um, so, just so that uh, we know what uh, we're doing. And uh, as I said, working crowdsourcing is a very slippery thing. So we wanted to have as solid a base on which to put these tagged emotions on top of it. Oh, by the way, um, uh, we used, precisely because we didn't trust the crowd, so to speak, um, we only used results that were uh, towards the extremities of the spectrum, very happy, very frightening. And we also used a second system uh, a software program which is called sentiment analysis, which basically it's, it has a vocabulary of about 3,000 words, half positive, half negative, and it's a little more complicated than this, but basically counts how many of these words appear in a given passage and then tags it as well. Here too, we, so we had humans and computer working with the same passages, completely different methods, and we only took the results that were uh, um, very, uh, that were unlikely to be uh, uh, random. But as I said, we wanted to have a solid basis, so we began with some less disputed uh, measures, and which had to do with real London and fictional London before moving to the emotion. This, you will know about this. I feel funny and a little arrogant lecturing in London about the emotions of London. But anyway, this was the growth of London in the course of the 19th century. If you put 1801 at 100, it was five times as populated at the end of the century. And uh, uh, 
follow now three maps from Roy Porter's Geography of London. This is London around 1800. And uh, let me show them. This is London a generation later, and this is London in the 1870s. Going back, as you can see, in London around 1800 has a very visible west-east uh, topography. This is a city, like many cities that uh, develop around a river, the river becomes the axis of the city. Something like that happened in Paris, happened in Rome. In Rome, the city, the river goes more like north-south and makes a little, a very big, but you know, this often happens. It has this uh, um, horizontal uh, west end uh, uh, dimension. And uh, this is very clear, for instance, from this mid 18th century map of London by John Rock. And even the growth of London in the uh, subtle side between end of the 18th, early 19th century still follows more or less that dimension. It adds uh, quite a lot to the west end, south of the parks, and then, you know, it's like it begins the expansion towards east, but it retains that dimension. What happens in the course of the 19th century is I think that this uh, uh, original uh, dimension of London acquires a very marked north-south axis. You can see it here in the 1830s, as very often is the case when cities grow, they grow by sending out tendrils at times, geographers call them. These are the large roads that connect a city to another city or to a general direction. And uh, you can see a, a, an urban development of this. These are tramway lines and how sort of uh, south-north is so strikingly the dominant dimension of tramway lines at the end, uh, uh, created at the end of the 19th century. And then, you know, uh, the rest is, is, in a sense, is the city filling up these tendrils that had moved uh, uh, north and south and acquiring from that rectangular shape that it used to have, acquiring this uh, uh, circular shape, which is uh, uh, typical of London and of uh, many cities, and which is, by and large, uh, still the one it has to be. Okay, so this is real London. I have no problem using the word real. I will probably use the word fact more than once also during this talk. This is a growth of real London. And from 1700 to 1900, it's really a very significant change of shape. Now we're going to look at the growth of fictional London in the same period um, by half centuries. London in the first half of the 18th century according to how often a certain toponym is mentioned, you have a larger circle. This is uh, um, clear. And it's really largely the city. And uh, uh, yes, it uh, more or less stops where we are now. I mean, there are some uh, um, mentions also in the West End, but it's basically the city. What happens in the second half of the 18th century is, as you can see, that the West End becomes a very significant presence in its own right. This is clearly now a system which has, in a sense, just like the growth of London was mostly in, uh, in that westward direction, so is the growth of fictional London. Then, in the first half of the 19th century, nothing happens. And in the second half of the 19th century, nothing happens. London changes enormously in reality, and almost not at all in fiction. This was the first um, completely unexpected finding uh, that we got from our study. We, remember, we were doing this just to provide a basis. And instead, we realized that, uh, these are, of course, these are large numbers. These are thousands and thousands of entries of toponyms. Uh, so the, uh, I will also mention a couple of specific novels uh, later on, but you know, don't think of the novel which violates this scheme. This is the scheme, though. This is the matrix for hundreds of novels over 200 years. So this is the problem that uh, all of a sudden we have to explain. 
stability. And stability is much harder to explain than change. Or at least it's harder to explain than change when the reality underneath changes. It would have made so much sense, had we, so much more sense, had we found, uh, you know, fictional London replicating real London. I mean, or at least it would have made more sense if one thinks that fiction follows reality. Which, when you are a materialist, more or less you think. Eh? And uh, so uh, that, that's what I was expecting. And I would have liked to find something more refined, but that was my basic expectation still. I didn't expect it. Okay, so how does one um, explain stability? But first, actually, first, just to, to, to give a more abstract representation of this, this is, a, this is a chart with the various London boroughs. And uh, uh, see, this is uh, Westminster and then the city of London, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see, Westminster and the city of London have a disproportional uh, uh, presence uh, within uh, uh, the law. And we devised uh, 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 what I like to think is an elegant way of looking at this data, which is um, the next matrix that I'm going to, the next uh, chart that I'm going to show. This is the population of the various boroughs, and that's, those are the mentions in novels. And uh, uh, this is all normalized, that is to say, it's expressed in. Uh, uh, hundreds of thousands and uh, thousands of mentions, but uh, it's, uh, um, these are all percentages. So if a certain borough had a population of 50 and were mentioned 50 times, that borough would find itself along this 45 uh, angle, uh, 45 degrees uh, bisecting line. And uh, which is the one which would represent a balance. You have a certain population and the same percentage in mentions. But as you can see, most, in most cases, obviously the opposite is happening. There are two boroughs, which are in the West End and the city, which, are, which have a much higher number of mentions than their population would uh, uh, allow for. And then most other, this is a zero sum game, most other boroughs have a much lower uh, uh, percentage of mentions than their population would uh, uh, um, should uh, uh, afford them. So this gives you, and the line incidentally, see it's thicker in 1800, each segment is 10 years. So the over-representation of the city and of the West End grows in the course of the uh, 19th century and is at, it, at its maximum at the end of the 19th century. So it's not that it's, it was an initial overrepresentation that remains there. No, it becomes more and more such in the course of the century. And for many of the other boroughs, the opposite is true. One final um, uh, version of these maps. We looked at uh, um, five main uh, uh, divisions, west, north, the city, south, and east. and. Uh, how much space various authors devoted to these. And as you can see, there is a bunch, a lot of authors that uh, devote a very large percentage of their fictional work to the West End. Uh, uh, almost uh, the number drops drastically as we move. And only one author, Walter Besant, devotes a significant, one author of those in our corpus, devotes a significant uh, portion to the East End. One final image of it. This is Dickens. This is Dickens's uh, presence. And uh, as you can see, Dickens is the London novelist, but it's a London novelist. Actually, others, Trollope, Gore, etc., were as much London novelists as he was. He is the archetypal London novelist, not because he writes more about London, but because he writes more evenly about London. His London is more complex. And this actually. It's something that I have found uh, a long time ago when I was working at the Atlas and that this data uh, corroborated, even though I was surprised by how percentage-wise low the role of the East End plays is. It's, it's clearly more of a qualitative role. And then there is another complication, which I will come to later. All right. 
So, emotions of London as a plan, real and fictional London. In fictional London, we discover this strange stability in the face of a city that was changing. It wasn't just changing the city. I mean, London was really, through industrialization, changing the world. So why this stability of its fictional imaginary? I think that here one can give three, perhaps four explanations that uh, uh, add something to each other. It's like the pieces of a puzzle. Remember, we basically have to explain the stability of the city and of the West End. And uh, this is Addison on London, an aggregate of various nations distinguished from, each, from one another by their respective customs, manners, and interests. The inhabitants of St. James are distinct people from those of Cheapside, who are likewise removed from those of the Temple on the one hand, and those of Smithfield on the other, by several climates, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you know, here you get a sense of what is it that makes the city, to begin with, so stable in the imaginary of uh, uh, British novelists, is the fact that the city is itself a concentrate of London in that it is a concentrate of urban, certain central, urban services and activities. And the city, in other words, is not what the West, the West End is one. And I will try to explain stability in terms of unity. There is one quality to the West End. But the reason why the city remains so stable is that the city actually offers different novelists different opportunities. The city uh, uh, meant as a wall and perhaps with the addition which uh, in fiction is often considered uh, plausible uh, of considering the tower as part of the city. Because this is the tower, this is Gothic novels. For Gothic novels, this part of London is really the tower. There is a focus on the cities insofar as there is a, an attraction given by the tower, and the same for historical novels. But, a generation later, with Newgate novels, 1830s, 1840s, the interest moves to the space of the law and of repression. It's the old Bailey and indeed Newgate uh, prison, with obviously appendixes elsewhere, like Tyburn, where they would hang criminals. So there is, it's already, you know, there is, as you can see, different genres, specialists, and then another generation goes by. And this is a little peculiar. Harriet Martineau, for her, the city is a Bank of England in her illustrations of political economy. It's another central service. Dickens is the one who makes this, unfortunately, it's not, it's not a very good map, but it gives you an idea of how varied for, for, for Dickens is the, the world of the law, the world of the, uh, of the bank, indeed, the world of the river, uh, the world of the uh, intellectual professions. Uh, uh, and the same for, uh, for other, uh, and this remains uh, till the end of the century. Um, the first meeting between Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson occurs in St. Bart's. I mean, it's, you know, it's uh, not much, but it's as if the permanence of these central institutions at the center of London. So why does the city remain so stable in uh, English fiction, because it's really not one place, but several places. Then if you move up in terms of abstraction, it seems like one, but it's actually two. The West End is a different story. The West End is a different story. This is a writer of the 1830s and 40s, Catherine Gore. She was the leader of a specific London genre known uh, because of a joke by Carlyle as uh, the Silver Fork novel. And as you can see, the two maps are almost interchangeable. See, incidentally, if I can go back, how completely different from the maps of, say, the Newgate novels. Uh, so they're all London novels, but the Barry Center has moved from uh, the West End, to, from the city, sorry, to the West End. And why was the West End so stable? 
Here it's not, the explanation cannot be the one given. It's not that it has a bank, a hospital, uh, law courts, uh, prisons, uh, publishers around St. Paul, etc., etc. No, the West End is really a class. It's really the upper class. But there is something very peculiar about the British upper class. This is, uh, um, again, from Roy Porter, a passage which tries to explain why the West End remains the real West End, not the fictional West End. Bloomsbury, Bedford, etc., etc., and uh, you can read all those. They made the emergent West End an accumulation of units detached from each other, lacking uh, the great Georgian estates have remained with their clones, such as Belgravia and Kensington, the chic places to live, shop, saunter, and dine. No Victorian suburb eclipses the West End. He's absolutely right. Other great cities, the Paris of Balzac is very different from the Paris of Zola one generation later. The center of gravity has moved. The center of gravity of the upper class. In London, the center of gravity has never moved. You made it into the upper class, you wanted to live where the old upper class. And simplifying somewhat, but you know we have to simplify when we move at this uh, uh, level. And uh, this is, I think, this is peculiar to the formation of the English uh, upper class, and especially in its uh, London uh, um, incarnation, so to speak. And this is, I think, the key reason for what uh, we see as a stability insofar as the English novel in the course of the 19th century continues to be a chronicle of upper class life, and it does continue to do that, it remains, it, it cannot move from the West, because that's where that kind of life is being led. Then there are authors who seem to transcend, I mean, many of you may have thought about uh, guessing as I was giving uh, this little spiel on the stability of London. And here, clearly, the, uh, you know, uh, in Gissing's oeuvre as a whole, neither the city nor the West End plays a very important role. On the other hand, and here I'm going to move, it's one of those brief moments of actual um, um, single case, meaning if you take New Grad Street, Gissing's greatest London novel, it is true that it begins and it, uh, um, it sort of stays for much of the story uh, in Bloomsbury, right? Near the British Museum and up towards Islington, that's where all the characters live. But the whole point of New Grad Street is that this intellectual middle class is unstable. You cannot simply stay there. You're either going to make it or you're going to fail. And uh, interestingly, those who make it, the red rectangles are, indicate the starting point for the characters. They all start there. Those who succeed move all to the West End. Those who fail move east or uh, to the suburbs or to the end disappear. So even for someone who, like Gissing, who was writing, so to speak, the first great chronicle of North London, he could still only see the conclusion of the story he was telling in terms of the old geography when Rairdon, who is, uh, the, uh, starts working uh, here between Clerkenwell and the uh, East End, that's the beginning of the end for him. I mean, his wife abandons him, his relatives uh, also. And uh, so the symbolic polarization, even in a naturalist novel like this very late in the century, in the 1890s, is still at work. OK. Why the stability of uh, fictional London? Because actually the city uh, uh, was, could play different aspects of itself for different generations, because the West End uh, was the site of an upper class with a capacity for inclusion that other upper classes in European states did not possess. There is then a third reason, that city and West End constituted two narrative poles. 
They, in other words, it's not just what the city could do by itself and the West End by itself, but the existence of these two poles could, what are they doing up there? <laughs> could, could structure a little narrative system. And the way in which we looked at this was this. We took all the passages uh, um, which had a West End toponym, all the passages which had a city toponym, and uh, then looked at the words that were most distinctive of these two big boxes of passages. And this is something you can calculate rather simply. You know, you assume the expected frequency of the word if it uh, occurred in the West End as often as anywhere else in London, in the city, the same for the city. Then you see which words occur much more frequently than they usually uh, like, for instance, um, toponym uh, occurs in this uh, room probably 50 times in a year. Huh? So say there are 50 talks, you would expect it to occur once per talk. But actually, tonight, it's probably going to occur 40 times. So toponym becomes a very distinctive word of this talk because it's frequency. Fine. And, uh, well, I guess I just skipped a whole, yeah, this was, uh, uh, this was really the premise for what I've just said. You know, the fictional London, these two half worlds, this is a wonderful map from the 1720s from uh, uh, St. James, I think. Uh, look how this is, uh, over there, of course, it's St. Paul. And look how, these are really two worlds, eh? Two worlds, uh, it's, uh, this is, the park, and then there is the river, then there is a part of the south bank, then there is again the river, and then finally you get to the city. I mean, it looks like it's another continent almost. In the imaginary of London, of the London that was, this was an enormously uh, strong, uh, uh, like two antipodes of city life, West End and uh, city. This is a lovely passage from Pride and Prejudice, where these people are in the West End, they talk about people in the city, and they laugh about them. I mean, it's just, even though eventually one of them will marry the heroine, as those of you who've read the novel know. All right, these are the most distinctive words of the West End. And, uh, yeah, um, they, it's not that they are unexpected. It may make a little more sense when we look at the most distinctive words of the city. And then uh, when we look at the two together, actually, see, the West End is clearly a world, a world defined as a class, those first two lines, square park gardens, Edward Earl, servants, order, design. But it's also a word. Um, defined by this um, activity. This is a time, you can see how one could make a novel with this stuff, right? <laughs> uh, right? This is a world of sociability. It's a, it's a certain type of novel, but it's a, it, uh, and uh, it's also a certain type of language, grave, usual, particular, hard. It's a very careful language. Look at the adverbs and then at the semantic of those, you know, everything is Waited. And then it is also um, clearly this, her, um, there is a statistical um, measure that tells you uh, whether when a word appears as distinctive, uh, uh, it could be uh, just by chance. Or, and uh, her has a, a hyperbolically high value in terms of uh, uh, certainty that this is not random, that the West End is really defined as a, so it's a, it's a, it's a world of uh, alliances, of careful marriages, etc. The city, the city, no, the city is a world of movement, of space and movement. There is no movement here. So everything is very careful. This is a, so a, it's a world of movement. It's a world of potentially of danger. And uh, it's also this, I was dropped from this. Uh, see, the West End is really the world of a class. The city is much more sort of a national space in the imaginary. 
And so what these uh, um, two groups of distinctive words tell you, this is the basic raw material for a narrative system. You have a, a set of potential narrative oppositions. In a sense, um, to have a narrative, you need a discrepancy. You need an opposition. You need some struggle of some sort. You have it here. What was surprising for me was that when I was looking, uh, when I was studying London and Paris in the book uh, Rosa mentioned, um, and I was just basically reading uh, Balzac and uh, Zola and Dickens, uh, what, what I thought I saw, no, what I'm sure I saw, uh, was that in the course of the 19th century, city novelists broke what had been a, um, a, a narrative mold of extreme long duration. They had, this is a binary structure, right? This is a story of London made of two sub-worlds within London. Well, Balzac and Dickens in different way had created a new image of a city as having three poles rather than just two. The third pole was, for both of them, importantly, one version of what we often call middle class. Especially for Dickens, this was important. And this also generated a very different type of novel. When you have two poles, the basic structure of a novel can only be one of antagonists. When you have three poles, things get much more complicated. And it was this complication that was introduced by city novels. And I'm still convinced that Dickens and Balzac work like that. The point is the large scale matrix behind them that did not, did not change, or did not change in the course of the 19th century in Britain, not in ways that are recognizable. So this makes, in a sense, the achievement of that tripolar narrative structure even more striking, but it also tells you that not all innovations sort of uh, take hold uh, right away. All right, so I've talked here for I've, the emotions of London. I've talked for, what, 35 minutes? Not a word about the emotions of London, but <laughs> eventually everything comes to those who can wait. This is what happened. This was, uh, you know, green stands for happiness, red stands for fear, and these are the results of passages. But remember, we had asked both the crowd and the program to tag passages as happy, frightening, or neither. If you take neither away, you get this. If you leave neither in the mix, you get a very different kind of map, which is this. Here, only dark brown signals the presence of a strong emotion. Everything under that signals fundamental neutrality. And you see, it doesn't matter. In the previous, in the previous image, Regent Park was uh, uh, a seat of well-being and the Pool of London and the Tower were uh, seeds of danger. But here, we're only looking at intensity. It doesn't matter whether good or bad, uh, scary or happy. The truth is, most toponyms in London novels are not associated with emotions. So you're, uh, <laughs> you, you, you design this project to find emotions. You find some, but really, and you know, see, especially in quantitative work, say that you decide to write your dissertation on the emotions of London, and specifically on these two opposite ones. You look for passages signaling fear. You look for passages signaling well-being. If you are inclined to geography, you make a map like this. And you've done your duty. You've done nothing wrong if you state quantitative work has 
an advantage, which doesn't always feel like an advantage, but I think that from the viewpoint of knowledge is one, which is that actually if you find a lot of data that go against your inclination, you, cannot, you can suppress them, but it's dishonesty. I mean, it's, it, it is obvious dishonesty. So the real find was not the emotions, but was the neutrality. What? This seemed strange. You know, those of you who work on 19th century or read 19th century novels know that these are novels where emotions play uh, a very strong role, especially uh, extreme emotions. So it seemed that this sea of neutrality was uh, uh, a little much. Then something occurred to me. Remember, we were not really getting data about emotions in London. We were getting data about emotions near mentions of toponyms. So we were getting data about emotions in public. <coughs> so maybe we could run a, a sort of parallel experiment, say that passages uh, uh, in which emotions were tagged were you know, a certain number of passages, 3,000 passages. We would get 3,000 passages, again, 100 <coughs> words, in which, however, no toponyms <coughs> would be mentioned and see if the result would be different and find at least one thing we got right. Uh, indeed, happiness is twice as present when no place name is mentioned. And these are the various scores we only, it doesn't matter. This is the important one, the final, the final comment. And this is even truer for fear. Fear is, is uh, uh, you know, 60% um, more likely to happen when no place name is mentioned. Now, however, these two um, bar graphs, these two histograms, uh, basically tell the same story, may have very different uh, um, reasons behind them, very different explanations. This, and here I'm speculating, we haven't done the actual, the legwork looking at you know, a few hundred passages to see. I think in the case of happiness of well-being, uh, the reason is that in most cases, indeed, no toponym is necessary. People are happy at home. Most of them, you know, many, quite often in novels. And so that's why happiness is so much more frequent when no toponym is uh, presented. For fear, for fear, uh, things may be different, and this also may explain why the East End uh, in general, which was associated in 19th century imaginary with fear, is so underrepresented in our maps. And uh, uh, the reason is this, that one, think, think about it, when are you afraid in an urban setting? When all of a sudden, you're not sure where you are. But if you're not sure where you are, and that's not just a component, but the source of the fear, it's not a good idea for the novelist to provide information about where you are. <laughs> so uh, very often, passages that evoke fear, like this from a late 19th century novel, midnight was at hand in a, as in a small, ill-furnished room above a low shop in one of the dirtiest, narrowest, more ancient looking lanes in the oriental moiety of the city, blah, blah, blah. This is, this is clearly a geographical definition, which however realizes itself without mentioning toponyms. Our program always missed this. And it becomes very, it's, it's very tricky to try and uh, recover. But I, you know, again, speculation, Speculation, let's say a hypothesis that can be tested. I would not be surprised if it turned out that of these passages where fear is very strong and no toponym is mentioned, the majority actually had not to do with scenes that, um, that unfold in private, 
but with scenes that unfold in a public space which is not specifically mentioned by name. This becomes a strategy for representing uh, um, the East End. This has something to, no, this. So this is, this is one um, aspect um, of, the, uh, of the story. We have not, find, we have not found uh, emotions in public because the happy emotions tend to be often uh, unfolded in the private sphere and because the frightening emotions tend to happen in places that, are not, that have no name. On the other hand, this was not the whole story. There was a real finding about the presence of neutral passages. Whenever toponyms are mentioned, neutrality is the fundamental emotional tone. And this certainly corroborated ideas that historical sociologists before us had developed, this is from Richard Sennett, but Zimmel could be mentioned uh, uh, equally, it was the beginning of a style of dressing in which neutrality, that is, not standing out from others, was the immediate statement. In public, people did not want to stand out in any way. They did not want to be conspicuous. They wanted to be neutral. Irving Goffman's uh, unfocused interaction is another version of, and it's, again, linked to city life, <laughs> Uh, Zimmel's blasé type, uh, for which uh, looks equanimously and with equal distance and boredom about everything is another type. There are many instances of this case. We provided corroboration for these various theories. Corroboration in the humanities is considered boring, and truth be told, is boring, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's actually a fact of, uh, of life in the sciences when they I find corroboration for a theory, that's a good thing. For us, it's less interesting, and I suspect we don't only have bad reasons for that, but you know, in much, of, much of this work, it's digital humanities, uh, well, it's clear at this point I'm not giving a triumphalist account of the enterprise, zigzags, you look for one thing, find the opposite. I mean, so, um, digital humanities, uh, has always, the quantitative approach, has always to achieve two things at once that are not easily combined. First, you have to prove that your method is as reliable as a living human scholar would be. But in order to prove that, the method must basically repeat what the living, reliable human scholar has already done. So corroboration always has to be an element of these new methods. Otherwise, people would say, well, what? Are you sure that there wasn't a bug in the program? I mean, we say that to ourselves when we do. And corroboration. And on the other hand, then you have also to go beyond corroboration. So it's, it's a strange uh, double act that these studies uh, uh, have to do. But anyway, the, this we had corroborated to give you an instance of when corroboration is more than corroboration. I wish I had done this. This was done by a, a, a young man who was an undergraduate at the time. And he was studying loudness in the novel. And uh, he realized, he read, this is decade by decade, the 19th century. Red is extreme loudness, people screaming. Uh, dark blue is people whispering, and this uh, sort of uh, azure here is the neutral tone of, uh, which is embodied by the verb said. And as you can see, said, whoa, um, sorry, and somehow, said in the course of the 19th century almost doubles its presence. I mean, it's, it's this extraordinary, as I said, I wish this, in a sense, is, corroborates the idea of it, but it makes it, 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 it makes it much more dynamic. It shows, uh, uh, um, it shows it in relationship with other ways of uttering, et cetera. So we found something much more boring, which is, you know, 
the percentage of passages in both uh, tagged as emotionally neutral, yeah, they grow a little bit, but not even that much. I mean, they're just, uh, it's as if narrative in public had always had, already in 1700, a uh, fundamentally neutral tonality. Final bit of this talk, I will focus on whatever value one may give to the finding of um, happiness and fear. Incidentally, for those of you who wonder, the Pool of London here, which doesn't exist anymore, was uh, like a precursor of the docks. And um, it was very small, very crowded, very um, accident prone, uh, and uh, in all sorts of ways, smuggling, murdering, blah, blah, blah. And so um, early 19th century novelists uh, enjoyed using it uh, for uh, moments of melodrama and so on. So this is the basic um, geography of uh, emotions in London. And uh, you, here we repeat it. As you can see, there is a clear deformity between the two halves of the city. I will again do it, follow it half century by half century. The first half of the 18th century when London, fictional London, is still mostly inside uh, the city wall or immediately after, uh, immediately beyond the city wall, the temple, and so on. Uh, um, the emotional tone tends to be red, which is a sense of danger, of uh, uh, fear. Uh, uh, gray is ambivalence between the two uh, feelings. So this is, uh, this is not a happy city. Right at the beginning, London, uh, early London novelists present a city which is filthy, which is uh, dangerous, uh, which is. Then, in the second half of the century, uh, the West End gets added, and uh, the situation already changes. The West End has a much greater concentration of, you know, happiness, well-being. As I said, that uh, uh, that emotion uh, had shades that we couldn't always control neither with the crowd nor with the program. So, but basically, it's the advent of a region of well-being within the geography of London. And, uh, you know, in the passage from, you know, this is the first half of the century, and uh, as you can see, frightening passages are about half as frequent as uh, happy ones. At the end of the century, they're only one-fourth. So the balance between the two emotions is really changing quite markedly. This is, again, the map from 1750, 1799. But the real triumph of London well-being is the first half of the 19th century. This is Britain, which has defeated France in the Napoleonic Wars. It has defeated its own industrial workers uh, with Peterloo and the Poor Lows. It is enjoying uh, uh, supremacy over the rest of the world that uh, will stay for, uh, for a few more decades, but of which this is really the founding moment. And it is in this period, actually, see, this is a close-up of what we were seeing. And what happens, of course, is that this is Regent's Park. So this is the period in which Regent Street is erected as a sort of symbolic act to separate uh, one part of London from the rest. And it's a symbolic act of whose meaning the inventor of Regent Street, Nash, was perfectly um, aware, would provide a boundary and complete separation between the streets and squares occupied by the nobility and the gentry and the narrow streets and minor houses occupied by mechanics and the trade. So it is really a fascinating. Seldom do you encounter such clear-cut sense of um, social arrogance which is projected on the um, material structure of a city. So this is, you know, again, that map from uh, 
from 1800 to 1850. And then in the second half of the 19th century, things get, as you can see, a little the basic paradigm doesn't change much, but uh, things get a little more complicated. One final problem about uh, um, digital humanities projects, especially exploratory projects, is that they go on and go on and go on, and then at a certain point they end, but since there wasn't a clear-cut question to begin with, they end in a rather inconclusive way, and this end in this inconclusive way. Thank you very much. Thanks, Franco. And we have some time for questions. There is a microphone going around. So if somebody wants to ask a question. Carolina, can I have the microphone? Yeah, let's keep um, I was wondering, you said that many happy, um, well, happiness of spirit in Cyrus. Would it be too vague to also include not really places, but uh, words like house? Well, um, the problem with that, no, no, it's, it's a perfectly good question. Um, it could be done. Of course, then the number of occurrences is multiplied. Um, we haven't yet got to that point of refinement. One would be you know, refinement, uh, that farther step of looking, okay, where are these other passages that measure located? Where are the, the uh, so this would be one looking at spaces defined as private. The other one, which has to do with the opposite emotion, would be, um, OK, let's look now. Let's have another sample of 3,000 passages where we have a street, a lane, a, an alley, or one of those alleys. You know, you, you, There are ways of putting all of this in and see what the result is. So that is to say, a street with no name to see whether the percentage of uh, this sounds simpler to do than it is. I do not program, so I rely on uh, uh, Ryan or someone else for programming. And uh, we've tried once, it, it, it didn't work. I'm, I'm not sure these things often you have to try more than once. As I said, it seemed simple to me. It turned out not to be simple. Thank you, that was a great, great talk. Um, I, I wanted to ask about whose emotions are being mapped. I was very struck um, in, um, in when you talked about her, and I thought, okay, she is the object here. Um, so, so there's an issue about point of view and narrative perspective that you can, you can pick out if you're doing a literary analysis. But, but so it's, so there's, that's the question, really. It's not just the place of emotion, but also the the origin of the emotion, you know, where does it come from? Yeah, um, well, this in our initial, um, so to speak, matrix for our taggers, <coughs> there were indeed, uh, uh, there was type of emotion, type of character, social class, if you can. This turned out to be very, I mean, very often, it's not a single character. Um, so you don't know how to identify it or the number of times when you can be reasonably certain about social class is so small that it's unreliable. Um, this, is, um, this originated a little naively as a big large scale study. For that type of uh, more detailed analysis you have to design and and we thought that you know things would emerge easily uh, no you have to design something a little more precise to begin with and uh, we did not do that so um, all we found was inconclusive in those fields 
Um, I was interested, have you noticed, I'm not, I'm not sure when these places are built, but if, if places are built of concentrated happiness or sadness, um, like, I mean, the towers always existed, I'm sure. I mean, you know, within this period. But uh, do, you know, do you notice if, if when uh, sadness gets concentrated in a particular place, fear. Then, fear, fear. fear, sorry, yeah, fear gets concentrated in a particular place, that happiness uh, sort of in other places blossoms more generally or the other way around? You know, if, if a park is built where happiness is particularly concentrated, then suddenly you get more fear generally in other places? What I have noticed in that respect, and I think this is the chart, it takes, uh, it seems to get, here we go. Um, as you can see, uh, the spaces of fear tend to be enclosed spaces, typically jails, tribunals, uh, you know, what, the Pool of London, Smithfield, which is, uh, you know, um, it's not an enclosed space, really, I mean, it's, but it's, uh, it's a, whereas what is striking about the geography of well-being is how many streets there are. I mean, it's, it's very often it's a feeling that the novel trans conveys while a character is moving. As if movement were by itself, the freedom of movement were immediately associated. So this seems to me, from the viewpoint of types of spaces, the main difference. That one, and of course the parks are always space of movement, uh, that one is a space of movement and the other is a space of enclosure. Um, Mm, that's beyond that, I won't go uh, for now. Many of these, we, we've looked at passages, but to do something else, which I have not had the time to present uh, tonight. So, you know, um, work like this always wavers, you know, between giving the program the order to find a large uh, number of data and then a second order in which you say, OK, of the data tagged as happy, pull me out 500 passages. So that I, well, and then you read them, and then you think about them. And uh, in, uh, in some cases, we've done it, and we found no results. And in a case like this, we haven't yet done it. I mean, trying to figure out the difference between spaces of movement and spaces of, uh, like that spaces of, that fear should be connected with spaces of enclosure makes intuitive sense. Because, you know, in novels especially, it has a lot to do with being a prisoner, with being kidnapped, with being threatened, uh, and so on. Whereas, if you can move, I mean, as, as long as you can move, uh, you know, in most cases, you know, things are, are not that. Hi, yes, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask, was there any particular reason why you chose um, Fear and happiness, does that tell us something about themes as opposed to sadness and anger um, it, it, across these, these two centuries? Or does that suggest particular themes in the writing? No, no. Uh, initially, we had not chosen fear and happiness. Initially, and this, this was a part in which I actually wasn't involved, but um, there was a, a group that had come up with a whole gamut of eight different emotions. This created a total a mess. And at first, you know, our initial reaction was, well, because see, the crowd cannot think. So we decided to run a, a test and gave the same passages that the crowd had made such a mess of with the various emotions to volunteer grad students in English who got exactly the same result as the crowd. And so at that point, we realized that there was no way a human being could you know, really differentiate between so many shades of emotions. And so we decided to stick with two that seemed easiest to recognize. Not a great reason, but. Yeah, very often, you see, but this, so very often, you do what is doable, or at least what is doable with your imagination and uh, the possibility of a program. And uh, you want to do something more interesting, and it turns out that not all interesting ideas are 
as a jargon as it operational, uh, operationalizing them. That is to say that they cannot necessarily be transformed into a series of operations. And if they cannot do that, you cannot do this. Hi. Yes. This way. No, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh, he was. Is it possible to conclude that the writers are snobs that wish they lived in the West End? <laughs> you know, that their, their sphere of interest is the West End. And so they wish they lived there, they uh, had aspired to live there, so they set their characters there, I ignoring everything that was actually happening in the real London. Look, um, it's usually writers tend to write what they think readers would like to read. So this is not just the writers who are interested in that sphere. It seems to be much more of a um, you know, general desire. And in that respect, too, I think the English novel is, in my opinion, a little more Philistine than the French novel in the same period, <coughs> whose urban interest, especially with Zola, but even before Zola, is much more widespread along the social and geographical uh, uh, cartography of, of, uh, of Paris and other cities. But, you know, in, in that can be explained. I mean, the, up, the French upper class had been challenged repeatedly, violently, uh, in reality and symbolically, in a way in which the British upper class had not. So it retained much more of uh, sort of, you know, a halo, an aura of consensus, and, and this is a testimony of that. Or at least the West End part of it is a testimony of that. Um, beyond that, I am not sure. I, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Um, thanks for your talk. Uh, I was thinking about changes in the vocabulary to uh, represent emotions. Was that an issue? How did you tackle it? Because one of the things to spot for the mention of the word happy. But yeah. Um, no, well, uh, you know, this, this is a problem uh, perhaps with the crowd. Uh, certainly with sentiment analysis program, because I don't know how many of you know about these programs, but these are now programs that are, have become very important, and a lot of literary critics actually use sentiment analysis for also, which I think it's a, it's a very bad idea because they're intellectually very crude, and uh, linguistically they are trained on uh, the Wall Street Journal. So it's uh, the range of emotions, the type of, and the lexicon. Uh, it's, why are they trained on the Wall Street Journal rather than uh, the Victorian novel? Well, because sentiment analysis programs are important not for scholars, really, but for firms, because they're ways of gauging or hoping to gauge uh, the direction of uh, taste, of reasons of like and dislike. So this uh, does create a problem, clearly. That's why we decided to eliminate all passages where results were had a low score and keep only scores that were so high that, and you know, by manually controlling, high scores seem to me, I, I can't remember finding a single one in which I said, but this is crazy. This is not a scary passage. This is not uh, a happy passage. Fear is much easier to define than uh, happiness, incidentally. I mean, it's uh, in um, when 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 you actually read the passages, it's much easier to figure out when that is the emotion involved in that narrative. But so this is uh, this is an aside. You know, by and large, I didn't. Well, the, the language changes quite significantly from 1700 to 1900, but we didn't really try to follow that change. So on that, I, I, it's a good question. So it's, it's, it's a good problem. It's an interesting problem. This is a problem with these, with these uh, projects. You see, they, they, you can always, 
precisely because they're not led, they're not directed by a single question, but by explorations, you can, uh, it would be worth expanding in, in that direction as it would be worth expanding in that direction or in the direction of, I mean, it's uh, all of this, uh, but then it never ends and um, it's, um, I, I, I can't decide whether I like or not this uh, feature of this type of work, whether the, uh, the endlessness is, uh, is a virtue or is the sign that something was wrong from the beginning, otherwise uh, it would uh, Me, no? No. Oh, sorry. Hi, um, thank you very much for that. I wanted to ask you, uh, I mean, I've been following your work since uh, of uh, the European novel, and seeing you talk about, about this new work, I'm wondering uh, what have you learned about, about the novel via the use of digital humanities? Has it changed your vision of the novel? Or has it confirmed it? Or so tomorrow's, I'm, I'm giving another talk. I know you are at Queen Mary. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm giving another talk tomorrow, which begins exactly with this question. That, you know, okay, now we have these new archives and these algorithms. And it's great. It's as if, you know, it's Christmas and they've given you a telescope. And you can see uh, stars that you had never seen before. And has that changed anything? Has this changed anything? Bah. The strongest result is that corroboration of neutrality mm? in terms of emotions. And corroboration, as I said, it's, it's not nothing, but it's not what you hoped for. The most interesting result is the discovery of the stability of fictional law. That, I think, is interesting. It is often the case when you do quantitative work that uh, you, the, the, the first thing you see is that history moves more slowly than you remembered it used to move. Why? For a simple reason. The larger the number, the stronger the weight of the average and therefore the slowness of the movement. So it is in a sense an inevitable consequence of the choice of the quantitative approach. Um, whether that really changes uh, the way we look at history, unless, you know, unless um, I, I am not, I'm not yet sure. I'm honestly, and again, I think that tonight I will not hide it, even though maybe I didn't completely reveal it. I have I've been working, the first pamphlet of this literary lab came out five years ago been working at similar things for a few more years, earlier, so six, seven, eight years. I would have expected more, not only from us, but from around us. It's still early, but there are a lot of people working in this field with enormously powerful tools and gigantic archives. I would have expected more. Let me add, it's not that literary criticism outside of the digital humanities produces, you know, fantastic novelties every week. So we're not doing worse than the average <laughs> in the field. That said, the rest of the field is not claiming, okay, here we are, it's a revolution, we have new tools, new archives, etc., etc. So I would have expected more. And uh, in fact, much of the work I'm doing this year, not, not tonight, but you know, the work I'm doing, is an attempt to figure out why are results so disappointing? What would constitute a really good result? Um, and questions of this type. Because I think the time has come for things like that rather than for more, I mean, also for more charts, more, by all means. But charts done with the horizon at Stanford, we launched about a year ago a series of talks we invited, and the, the series was entitled, So What? And it was, you know, okay, we're all doing this. 
we're all accomplices in it. And, and then we had to stop it after two uh, you know, iterations because you know, no one wanted to answer that question. <laughs> so. Yeah, perhaps just one more. Um, um, okay. I have uh, one very brief question and, and, and another one as well. <laughs> um, the brief question is about the digital humanities and the methodology and its limitations you've been uh, talking about. And the question, very brief, is whether you are going to make all these data publicly available so that you don't just have crowdsourcing but crowd um, end users. And um, the other question I have comes from my own interest, and I'd love to um, mine your data to answer that. And, and it is, you have plotted emotions onto spaces and toponyms, but what about the uses of spaces or the different ways in which your characters um, act in space? Have you tried, for example, plotting um, fear and happiness onto verbs indicating movement or um, stationary um, um, state. Yeah. So um, the second question first. When we um, called out the those most distinctive words, I was hoping to find a lot of verbs. And often, when we uh, ask for most distinctive words from narratives, that's exactly what you find, because verbs. Uh, uh, simplifying somewhat um, uh, are associated with action and you know different types of characters different moments in the narrative would have different types of verbs but actually we didn't find that many verbs um, so in, in that respect it was uh, whatever then you have to believe what the program uh, tells you and uh, it simply that, that doesn't seem to be a salient difference at least in the West End city comparison. We didn't look for most distinctive words at a more uh, fine, at a finer grain uh, of research. Um, in other cases, verbs are indeed what most clearly differentiates um, certain um, na different narrative strategies. Not here. It's a bit strange, but so it is. The first question on uh, making data available. So um, our first uh, work from the Stanford Literary Lab, we did that. We kept the data for ourselves for three months, say, and then we made them available. Um, simply whoever wanted the data simply had to send an email saying, I want the data, and uh, then a portal would open much to my surprise, several hundred people asked for the data. Not a single person, much to my surprise again, ever sent a second email saying, you made a mistake, I will, why didn't you pursue this? I thought that was interesting. So this I found very baffling. Um, I doubt that I, you know, at times I would like to have access to the data. So after this, we thought, oh, this is strange. I mean, it's as if you know, the people have a lot of time uh, to waste, and then they want to. This is not the type of relationship we want. I mean, if someone wants data and then wants to engage in a company. Then the second problem, which is actually much bigger and which applies here, is that our data are from texts that are libraries legally owned. Libraries and lawyers behind libraries in the US, I'm sure here too, are very reluctant to open any gate to the public. So passages from novels that are recognizable and from which, uh, it's something that uh, I know it because right now we have a study conducted in tandem with a group in Paris. And for God's sake, we have a grant together with these people, we're studying the same thing. And even in this case, there are problems. 
So this is something that I hope would be resolved because politically it doesn't make any sense to, uh, but, um, but security about electronic access is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a new problem that we have to deal with and that I did not expect. And, you know, and, and, and there we are. I mean, and that's, uh, that at least is uh, it's something against which we have banged uh, our head. That said, if you want access as a person to this data, that can always be set up by all means. It's just that as a policy, it seems complicated.